Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this introductory session on contemplative education in the classroom. Now, before we get down to the business of trying out some of the contemplative activities I've organized for us today, I thought it best to tell you a little bit about what is contemplative education, and also to say something about why it could make a really great contribution to your classroom teaching. For starters then, probably most of you who have wandered into this talk and who have at least heard of contemplative education before associate it with sitting cross-legged on the floor and meditating. And sure, the lion's share of what folks mean when they talk about contemplative education has something to do with meditative practices. We can try some of that in a little bit here if you like. But contemplative education is broader than that, ladies and gentlemen. In the next little bit, let me explain to you what it's all about. Okay, so what is contemplation? Is it just navel-gazing? Maybe it's just thinking really hard about something. Well, not really. Allow me to give you a nice, succinct definition of contemplation from one of my favorite philosophic authors, a man named Josef Pieper. Here's what he has to say about it. Quote, A man drinks at last after being extremely thirsty and feeling refreshment permeating his body, thinks and says, What a glorious thing is fresh water. Such a man, whether he knows it or not, has already taken a step toward that seeing of the beloved object which is contemplation. How splendid is water, a rose, a tree, an apple, a human face. Such exclamations can scarcely be spoken without also giving tongue to an assent and affirmation which extends beyond the object praised and touches upon the origin of the universe. Who among us has not suddenly looked into a child's face in the midst of the toils and troubles of everyday life and at that moment seen that everything which is good is loved and lovable, loved by God? Such non-rational, intuitive certainties of the divine base of all that can be vouchsafed to our gaze even when it's turned toward the most insignificant looking things. If only it is a gaze inspired by love. That, in the precise sense, is contemplation. Unquote. I like this little description of contemplation very much because it renders simply what is most precious about the activity itself. So what is contemplation? Well, given Pieper's description of it, contemplation clearly has to do with those deep, deep feelings of appreciation we have from time to time, if we're lucky. And aren't such experiences dear to us? Don't they fill us with delight and gratitude? Don't they bring out to us, in the clear, just how rich and wonderful our lives really are? In lots of ways, I think such experiences reinvigorate us after so much humdrumness and grind. Or maybe, amidst all the sterility and numbness that can become rather prominent in our daily lives. I don't know about you, but I find that so much of what I do, and I see, and I experience from day to day, including the people I'm with, and the precious time I've been given to live, well... I guess I don't appreciate it or savor it as much as I should. I tend not to notice the significance of what's happening and what I'm given while I'm struggling through it all, except mostly in the form of being aware that I'm not aware or that I'm really seeing things as they truly are. And I don't wish to speak for anyone else here or everyone else here at least, but I'd have her, has her a guess to say, at least for a good number of us, there's a tendency to overlook, to neglect, or take for granted very many of the good things that we have. 
Our human capacity for contemplation addresses this problem of neglect and inattentiveness. And it's a wonderful human aptitude, ladies and gentlemen, because as people articulated in the passage I just read to you, given the right circumstances, contemplation is such a simple activity that we can engage in anywhere and any time. It's a basic human experience. And yet, as we shall see, contemplation isn't so lowly and basic either. It's given to us as part of our human nature, but sure, we, but we also need to cultivate and practice it. Ancient and medieval philosophic and religious thinkers wrote about contemplation as our highest form of knowing, in fact. Contemplation was always understood in ancient times as the most sublime and best form of cognitive activity, higher than our logic and reasoning abilities, and most certainly higher than the critical thinking that we push so hard to develop in schools. Why? Well, it was because contemplation was understood for thousands of years as that mode of cognition whereby human beings actually participated in something that was more than human, more than mortal. It allowed us to know that aspect of reality that transcends all duality, all manyness and change, and that reaches beyond the capacities of discursive reasoning. It was, in their view, the manner of our participation in immortality. Let me explain this strange idea to you a bit more carefully. Our word contemplation is closely associated through Latin with the Greek word theoria. As you can easily guess, theoria is the word from which we get our own much maligned English word theory. I say much maligned because it is a word heaped with scorn, abuse, and impatience these days. Nobody really has all that much tolerance for a theorist, after all. You know, guys like me, who have PhDs and are wandering around telling you their theories about things. And actually, I do get how annoying such people are. John Dewey, pretty much the father of modern-day progressive education, and therefore, of much of what we do in schools, notoriously said, An ounce of practice is worth a ton of theory. So he didn't have too much good to say about those who theorize, eh? And as teachers, who want to sit around, who, or rather, who wants to sit around listening to somebody theorize? You want something you can do. Something you can use. You want to see how the rubber hits the road, right? But then again, I really think this impatience arises from the fact that the word theory, with its roots in theoria, is so badly misunderstood and abused in modern parlance. Let me draw you back to the Peeper quote about what is contemplation. By that definition, us PhD eggheads who pontificate our theories aren't necessarily theorizing at all, are we? Maybe when a person is said to be a theorist, really all he's doing is spouting an opinion that has little or no grounding in any true sight or seeing or vision of the whole at all. And if the dryness and sterility of such opinions has any bearing on things, maybe these so-called theories are even less truly theoretical in character inasmuch as they do not erupt from a place of gladness, of joy, or gratitude. For like Pieper points out, true contemplative activity, or theoria, is a kind of loving gaze that sees and recognizes the goodness, the beauty, and the truth of what is. When we theorize, when we contemplate, when we feel a deep thankfulness well up within us. Contemplation, theoria. These words have to do with seeing, with deep seeing, with grand vision. And at their core, 
They have to do with a kind of gazing that is filled with love. In fact, I'd say you wouldn't be far off to call contemplation or theoria a kind of loving gaze that all human beings might, in, might engage in from time to time. Think about this for a minute. So much of the way that we think about what it means to know is caught up with our ideas about being objective. Someone who is objective has his head screwed on right, doesn't he? That is to say, if he's objective, his thoughts about whatever he claims to know aren't all tainted by irrationality and emotion. His judgment won't be biased by feeling, by preference, or by prejudice. We value objectivity, don't we? Certainly we seek out objective judges, like those old statues of Lady Justice where she's wearing a blindfold. Anyone who would be a good objective adjudicator of the facts must in some ways be blind to all extenuating factors, not moved by other things. So too when we teach our own students to do science. Don't we teach them this manner of dealing with the world and of studying it? That is, as subjects, we hold the world at arm's length as object for our studies and our investigations. Remember the famous saying by Francis Bacon, the father of modern science, about what we must do when we do science? Quote, We shall put nature to the rack and force her to answer our questions. Hmm, not exactly a lovey-dovey relationship he's cultivating there, eh? Bit too Fifty Shades of Grey for my tastes. Smacks of Gian Gameshi, I'd say. No. Here, objective knowledge is premised on the requirement to not love what or who one is coming to know, to dominate, or to master through knowledge. In fact, that's really what the word objective means, folks. See, objective is a Latin word. It comes from ob iictum, meaning to throw over against oneself. To be objective, to be a subject who studies and learns about an object, we necessarily must divorce ourselves from that object, throwing it over against ourselves in order to be able to see it clearly. And I don't mean to pick on scientists here. I'm an English teacher by trade and I can say with some confidence that the same goes for us when we're in English class with our students. When we're teaching them how to write good formal critical essays. One of the basic rules we all pretty much teach them is to get rid of the I in their writing. Don't use the first person pronoun. Assume the air of complete and utter objectivity in your analytic stance. Speak with a disembodied voice in your paper in order to maintain the tone that is proper to academic writing. Kind of bizarre, but that's what we do, right? Or again, take the instance of the medical doctor. Say you rush to the hospital for some major life and death surgery. You want a doctor who knows the body and the human anatomy backwards and forwards. You want somebody who has mastered that objective knowledge and who, when you're under the knife, is not going to be swept up in a theoretic or contemplative moment. You want somebody who's not moved by the sight or the feel of a human heart pumping in his or, own hand, his or her own hands. You want somebody who has cultivated the extreme of objectivity and who can send the scalpel into your flesh most efficiently in order to do the job correctly. That's why doctors don't perform such operations on their own kin, after all. Objectivity is prized. This fact cannot intelligently be denied. And sure, the doctor knows you in a certain way very well. So too does the social scientist, the sociologist, or the actuarial number cruncher. 
give him or her some basic data about your life, say your age, your postal code, your gender, or your income, and he or she will be able to tell you with some degree of predictability all sorts of distressing things about yourself. That's why insurance companies charge young drivers so much for car insurance, right? And yet, although the medical doctor and the insurance salesman both know things about you by treating you like an object, neither of them know you the way your mom does. Or the way that someone does with whom you've fallen in love. There is, ladies and gentlemen, a way of knowing the world that is not possible in this subject-object fashion. One can know things and people as it's, in this way, but not as thou's, not as persons with whom one bears intimate relation. This other sort of knowing only arises through loving. Indeed, it is this knowing by loving that is the essence of contemplation or the theoretic gaze. Now, sometimes when you read about contemplation, and in particular, how it's envisioned to play a valuable role in education. It's called a third way of knowing. What does that mean? Well, one way we know things is by our senses, right? And science is really good at enhancing our senses using technological advancements, without which we'd never be able to achieve all kinds of discoveries. Like the microscope and telescope, for instance, which allow our eyes to see things impossible uh, for us given our, only our natural capacities. Or the thermometer, which enhances our ability to feel heat or cold in a manner that is beyond what is given to our mere fingers. The second way of knowing, you might guess, is through our faculty of reason. We're rational beings, eh? We don't just feel or sense our way around the world empirically. We also radiocinate. We can figure things out through trains of logic and reasoning. Think of mathematical calculations that we can do and the sorts of problems we can solve that aren't really too much about the senses, but they just happen in our minds and that involve our ability to know by reasoning. Certainly there's a lot we can learn just by this form of cognitive activity, right? So, this third kind of knowing, this contemplative aspect, seems a bit mysterious to folks. Likely because our penchant for empiricist and rationalist approaches to knowing have been such forces in the history of Western civilization. Contemplative knowing is rather more related to what we nowadays call intuition. In fact, our word intuition comes from the Latin word or, meaning to look. So it has a certain resonance with the beholding function of theoria, or contemplation. Besides words like intuition, sometimes you hear t people talk about heart-knowing. That's another way to describe contemplation, or contemplative knowing. Now, I said just a wee bit earlier that ancient and medieval writers always prized this kind of knowing above the other two sorts. Why is that? Well, it's because we know that our senses tend not to tell us the truth about things all the time. They tell us some things, but we can be deceived by them too. And they only take us so far, right? Similarly with reasoning. Reasoning is good for discovering or unearthing truths that can be arrived at discursively, moving from point to point in a logical succession. But what about things that can't be known that way? What about non-things or non-objective reality? What about things that the only way you can know them is by not treating them as things or as objects? What about where you seek to know non-discursive reality? What is non-dual? What is unlimited? Say, for instance, you want to know not this or that instance of beauty in the world, 
or truth or goodness, but rather how this or that instance is related to goodness as such or reality as such. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a strange thing that we human beings tend to want to know about, for better or for worse. It doesn't show up on any program of studies anywhere. And probably, when you mention it to ordinary people in ordinary conversation, they'll look at you funny. But it is this contemplative activity um, of one who participates in the life of... Uh, in the contemplative life that Aristotle, for instance, was lauding when he ended his Nicomachean ethics with a discussion of the contemplative life. Or similarly, when he began his book, The Metaphysics, with, a res with the resounding words, All human beings desire to know. Most folks, I think, take Aristotle as far as, as more of a forerunner to the modern day scientist when he spoke about our desire to know. And I think most folks therefore associate him with the first two kinds of knowing. But really, if they ever bothered to read his books carefully from cover to cover, they'd see that the crown jewel of human cognition for Aristotle is contemplation, not discursive reasoning or empirical investigation. The philosophic and religious writers of the Middle Ages explained this privileging of contemplation slightly differently. They said that Theoria was best because unlike knowing by the senses or knowing indirectly through a chain of reasoning, contemplation is a perfect and direct kind of knowledge that arises through the identity of the knower with what is known. That is, where reasoning moves from point to point to point in a line towards its object, Theoria is characterized as non-discursive, simple gazing. It sees what is all in one look. In Theoria, the gap between seer and what is seen, between knower and what is known, disappears entirely, and each becomes the other in a unity. Let me once again refer back to Pieper for an explanation of this third way of knowing. Pieper remarks that to have a form means to be a specific being. That is, each thing is what it is because of the form it has. A horse is a horse because it has the form of a horse. Similarly, to know means that our mind is capable of taking on or having the form of other things. Essentially, to be the other thing, to be identical with the other thing, to be all in all. The mind knows horse by taking into itself the form of horse. This is the contemplative function of the mind. When it knows, it takes on the form of the thing of it knows, the form of the things it knows becoming identical with them. As the contemplative mystic Meister Eckhart once put it, even though the sense object does not give existence to the eye insofar as it is the eye, or a being, and the eye does not give existence to the sense object insofar as it is a being, nevertheless, insofar as they are in act as the eye seeing and the object being seen, they are still one. In one, in the same act, they are the eye seeing and the object being seen. Unquote. Take seeing away from the eye, and you take seeing you take away being seen from the object. Similarly, take away being seen from the object, and you take away seeing from the eye. So in Eckhart as in Peeper, to see and to be seen are one and the same thing, inasmuch as they begin at the same time and continue, cease and revive, originate and die, all at the same time. Okay, so now you can see a little bit better 
What is meant when we speak about contemplation as a kind of knowing that transpires through loving? And so far, I think you can see how contemplation relates to what we do when we philosophize as well as when we love and when we appreciate each other or whatever we come into intimate contact in the world with. But what does contemplation have to do with meditation? Isn't that what folks are mostly talking about when they implement contemplative education programs in their classroom? Well, yes. I think that's right, generally. But let me see if I can show you how contemplation is related to meditative practices before we launch into some activities. Here's the thing about contemplation, ladies and gentlemen. As a third way of knowing, it isn't concerned so much with knowing by the senses. Now, that doesn't mean that the senses are scorned. It just means that they aren't the name of the game here. Same goes for reasoning. In fact, any of you who have ever read a book of philosophy will know that philosophers are big on reasoning. And so it isn't that reasoning is scorned either as a way of knowing. It's just that in seeking to know sublime truth, goodness, or beauty, we have to not resign ourselves to this or that instance of goodness, truth, or beauty in the world. All these little instances are, in fact, not beauty itself, not truth itself, not goodness itself. Put another way, what the person engaged in the contemplative pursuit of wisdom seeks to find out isn't just this or that aspect of reality, but the totality of things. He or she seeks to know reality as such. So, any finite, desperate, or dual qualities that we espy in things, all this multiplicity with which we are concerned and reasoning and in the sensing? Well, to, paragraph, or to paraphrase the ancient Hindu contemplatives who wrote in the Upanishads, thou art not that. If, like Socrates says, the unexamined life is not worth living, and if self-knowledge is what is most essential as the means to know reality as such, then simply knowing our thoughts simply cultivating our mind's capacities for calculation and judgment, simply knowing what we like or dislike, what are our aspirations, our goals, and our dreams, this is not really to know thyself either. Indeed, all the contemplative traditions of the ancient world, regardless of their religious affiliation, agree on this point. That if what one loves or desires to know is this ground and totality of being, if what one seeks is to know reality as such, then one must cultivate a gaze that lovingly seeks beyond all these finite goods, these finite and passing beauties, these limited and partial truths. Regardless of how good they are, if one seeks to know their foundation, one must endeavored to put them all aside in some fashion, even if it's only for a little period each day, not mistaking any one of them for one's true beloved. Thou art not that. And what is this beloved? Thou art that, say the ancient contemplative texts. Today, I'll try to give you a basic introduction to how some of the ancient, uh, the different ancient contemplative traditions cultivate this kind of seeing, which involves leaving the ego behind, becoming less selfish, becoming more attuned to what is, and consequently becoming more filled with the gratitude in our awareness of what is. Let me start then with a brief explanation of yoga for you. Now. The yoga I'm going to talk about here isn't Hatha yoga with its downward dogs and all those yoga positions or ashanas. Very likely, some of you are yoga practitioners already, and so you know far more about that sort of thing than I do. Nope. What I want to talk about here is the older yoga that Patanjali practiced long before Hatha yoga 
in the ninth or 10th centuries. I'm referring to what is known as Raja Yoga, the royal or exalted path of yoga. It's a bit different. Simpler, I'd say, or at least less athletic, and without the attractive yoga pants. Anyway, to get started, the word yoga actually comes from the Sanskrit root word, yuj, which means to yoke. So think of yoga as a technique for yoking the mind. That is, for reigning in the tendency of consciousness to gravitate towards external things, to identify with them, to get caught up in them, and to try to locate happiness in them. Steady, sincere practice at yoga or yoking teaches consciousness how to turn inward towards itself and to realize the true nature of its underlying awareness. So let me see if I can render this simply for you. From Patanjali's Raja perspective, everything we know, we see, think, or feel, not just about the world around us, but also what we think of as ourselves, what we identify with as our self-consciousness, is in some deep sense not what is. This Hindu yogic view is stated quite succinctly as, Thou art not this namely all these mental and physical formations. Rather, thou art that. But what is that? In order to see what exactly that is, we first have to work hard to yoke or to rein in that tendency we have to suppose that what we see about the world and ourselves through the senses and reasoning really is what is. When in fact, from Patanjali's perspective, all such things are part of nature or or prakriti. They are impermanent stuff, subject to cause and effect, without inherent existence. In contrast to prakriti, Patanjali speaks of pure awareness, or purusha, which is not stuff of any sort. It is free of cause and effect, never created, never ending, existing beyond time. That makes it pretty elusive, eh? In fact, it seems silly to even speak about such a thing, since even to use the word it, or to assert that it exists, is to speak falsely of pure awareness by lending it a substantiality it does not possess. Purusha is beyond all thought and feeling and conception, being intangible, impersonal, and inconceivable. No wonder you can't get at it with the first two kinds of knowing, eh? Anyway, through the yoking or stilling process called Niroda, consciousness is let to settle to the point where it can reflect awareness back to itself. This is accomplished not by exerting the will to arrest or blockade thought, an action unlikely to succeed, though certain to perpetuate suffering, but by repeatedly relaxing back to the ever-present object. This is another reason why I think contemplative practice is so weird to us, especially when we are the types of people who've learned how to, how to power our own way through our own problems, to sweat and to toil and to push through to achieve what we desire. Contemplation doesn't work that way. Approaching contemplative practice that way is actually very counterproductive. Nope. In our yoking practices, we practice more than anything relaxing the will through indirect or through direct ah through directing it gently back towards a focal point of some kind the object upon which a person focuses varies from teacher to teacher concentration or focusing is a big part of yoga concentration or dharana builds spontaneously 
as the yoga practitioner softens up and opens up to experience, not through steely attempts at mind control. Here we practice our focusing our attention on a single object. This kind of meditation that focuses on a single point is known as samatha meditation. I'm suggesting to you, therefore, that Raja Yoga is a good example of samatha meditation. Now, eventually, as we continue diligently in our practices, from time to time, the only mental forms that arise will be those that are entrained to the same object as the preceding ones. This state of sameness is called absor absorption, or dhyana. It is where our entire perceptual flow is aligned toward the object of focus. And then, as one continues to cultivate absorbed concentration, the intervals between our thoughts will grow longer. In time, mental formations might cease altogether for minutes or even hours at a time. At this stage, consciousness can become so tranquil, tranquil that uh, object is seen as indivisible from subject. At such times, integration or samadhi has arrived. So these are the three developments of yogic practice essentially. Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. And they are said to arise as the relentless movements of consciousness come to a, san a standstill. Okay. So what does all this have to do with school and teaching? Well, Think of how Samatha meditation can help you and your students cultivate attention, focus, and concentration. Here, here we are in Alberta, heart of cowboy territory, so I'll use a real Albertan image to get things started. Think of the practice of yoking in school rather like corralling a horse, eh? In your classroom, the point of contemplative practice is not to immobilize the mind, but like a horse, to tame and develop it within a corral in which it's free to roam. Drawing upon ancient yogic insights and practices that cultivate concentration, absorption, and integration or oneness, we can help our students develop attention and meditative focus that culminates in emerging of the one studying with what is studied. For example, say you have your students focus on a particular theme or problem or item for inquiry. We can use Samatha techniques to develop their ability to get into that good sweet studying zone, eh? Look at this diagram of how a student's mind might look at the outset. See how, when you look at this diagram, you can see the mind moves absent-mindedly, right? Through a number of different um, interests, through um, desires, things like this. And when you're working with your students, what you're trying to do is you just get them to, first of all, recognize that these are the, these are the things that are rising and falling in their consciousness. These are the things that are affecting them. They're becoming distracted. They're distracted by all these things. What you want them to do is focus in on said problem or said theme or said question, right? So all you have them do as an experiment is every time that they catch themselves drifting away, ask them to gently put their attention back towards the thing that you're studying. And you practice this. It's a very simple practice, just redirecting the attention back towards the, fo the focus or the object of focus, right? That's all we're doing here. Okay, next, through the practice, or through practice and experimentation, we might note certain positive changes over time. The first step towards developing attentiveness or the ability to concentrate is to notice one's inattention and unstable concentration. 
So let's have the kids focus their attention on the theme under study. And every time they catch their minds drifting, engage them in the activity or task, redirecting their attention back to this theme. As their training progresses and as students begin developing their concentration, their distractions will diminish and they will find themselves better able to hold the theme more consistently. And once students are able to maintain consistent attention or focus upon their theme, this becomes the point at which authentic higher learning begins. This is the moment when intellectual intimacy arises between knower and what is known, between seer and seeing, a kind of union or melding with whatever it is that one is studying. The last challenge here is the problem of self-awareness, or the self as an impediment to true studium, that union of knower with known or seer with seen. A great deal of energy is drained from the contemplative process when one's attention derails into self-reflection. Then our attention is no longer fully view engaged with the task at hand. So good examples here, you remember them from when you were a kid, right? Um, Wiley e. Coyote, he can run right off the cliff, he can keep running, and he can go off. But as soon as he realizes, as soon as he becomes self-aware, what does he do? He falls down to the bottom of the canyon and, you know, crash. That's the end of him. Similarly, in the old frog and toad stories, I don't know how many of you have read these with your children or your students, but really very enjoyable and there's frog and toad, and toad's terrified of tobogganing, but frog convinces him to go tobogganing, and they, they go on this toboggan adventure, and at the early part of the adventure, frog falls off on the first bump, and toad doesn't realize that he's going down the hill all by himself. Um, and he's having a great time, and he's going through all these dangers, and oh my gosh, it's so excellent. But then, as soon as he realizes that Frog is no longer with him, then this little bubble bursts, he becomes self-aware, and then the first, he, he crashes at the first um, hazard. So, very similar items in uh, Frog and Toad, and also in the Roadrunner-Coyote uh, conflict. So that's the basics of yogic meditation, but really, it's the basics of meditation among all the other contemplative traditions as well. Meditation, if it's, ha if it's to have any merit as a contemplative practice, can't be at all complicated and esoteric, ladies and gentlemen. That is to say, it shouldn't involve you in all sorts of cognitive processes and in imaginative activities. activities. That would just make for more trouble, right? considering what a person is trying to do, isn't to stimulate the ego, but rather to leave it behind. So, it's not really surprising that meditative practices across the ancient traditions are so similar. For instance, maybe some of you have tried Christian forms of meditation. The one that's most well known today was brought to Canada by the Benedictine monk John Main, who died in 1982. Since then, his mantle has been taken up by the Catholic priest and Order of Canada holder Lawrence Freeman. I suggest to you that the Hindu and Catholic traditions of meditation are very similar. For whereas Hindu yogic traditions often focus attention on the breath as it enters and leaves the nose in that little triangular space just above your upper lip, or alternatively upon the area of the navel where the belly rises and falls, or again, alternatively upon the famous Om Mantra, essentially a sacred word that one repeats over and over again, Christian meditation ordinarily uses the Aramaic word Maranatha, Maranatha as its anchor or focal point. Now the word Maranatha is perhaps the oldest and simplest of all Christian prayers. It literally translates to Come Lord, Maranatha is pretty much the last word in the, in the New Testament, too. All that aside, when you use a mantra, it's not important that you know what the word means. In fact, 
focusing on the meaning of the word can actually be a tricky distraction because it activates your critical reasoning mind, which isn't the third way, right? It's not the third way cognition that characterizes true contemplative practice. At any rate, Christian medica- medication, Christian meditation is very much like the samatha meditation of Hindu yoga in this regard. One must sit up straight. One must sit perfectly still. One must say one's mantra faithfully for a period of 20 to 30 minutes. And if you can manage it, you ought to try find some time to do it twice a day. Say early in the morning, and then again in the evening. This is the recommended daily practice. I found that it's a fairly easy commitment to make, and that there are real benefits to it. Perhaps you'll find that as well. Or again, if you ever have a chance to visit a Shin Buddhist temple, you'll find people there committed to the dutiful recitation of what they call the Nembutsu. And that's a Japanese term for repeating Amida Buddha's name. You can find similar practices in Chinese Buddhism where folks recite Guanyin Bodhisattva's name. Or in Tibet, for instance, Om Mani Padme Hum. No matter the tradition, the purpose is the same, to cultivate self-knowledge, to know the true nature of what is by letting drop all else. And through the utterly simple focusing tool offered by the tradition to leave the ego behind. Now, having briefly explained a few Samatha meditative approaches, let me speak to you a bit further about another form of meditation known as Vipassana meditation. The word Vipassana is a Pali and a Sanskrit word that literally means insight or seeing through. So Vipassana meditation is also called insight meditation because it helps you see through to what really is. Now be aware that there's a lot of hoopla and polemical stuff (coughs) that you'll hear about how this or that kind of meditation is better. I don't wish to take up that quarrel here. I think it's misleading and self-serving. Generally, however, here is how Vipassana is distinguished from Samatha meditation. The idea behind Vipassana is pretty much the same as it is in Samatha traditions. It is. It's recognized that what we take ordinarily to be our real self, or the real state of affairs, isn't isn't in fact the case at all. Notably, we misidentify our true self with all these transitory states, with this flux of thoughts, feelings, and sensations with what are commonly referred to as our psycho-mental states. But rather than use a focal point to help us cling less to these fluctuations, as is done in Samatha techniques, when we take a Vipassana approach, we don't focus on a single point at all. Rather, we are enjoined just to watch everything as it rises and falls, to notice the flux of things, and how no thing that we ordinarily take to be a real thing, when we analyze it through careful observation, is actually a real existent thing at all. In Vipassana practice, we learn to release everything as it comes and goes in and out of our experience. We don't rely on any anchor to help us. We just observe. Just observe. Now, as we've already seen, there are many Buddhist traditions of contemplative activity that take a samatha approach. But, people who know about such things will mostly tell you that, classically speaking, Vipassana is the classical Buddhist type of meditation. The fellow who has most effectively popularized this form of meditation is S.N. Goenka who only recently passed away. You can try Vipassana meditation, by the way. Like Samatha, it's very simple, but very hard. So what do you do? Sit up straight. You breathe naturally, in and out. In and out with your eyes closed, just like you would if you were practicing the other forms. 
But with Vipassana, you won't have a mantra to focus on. And you won't focus on your breath at your nose or your diaphragm belly button area. You might start off with Samatha meditation, what Goenka calls Anapana. But you'll only use that practice to get calmed down and centered for the insight meditation to follow. Anyway, once you feel peaceful and focused, you'll leave off your one-pointedness meditation to engage in a kind of body scanning practice in which your attention isn't fixed but instead constantly moving, constantly, constantly observing sensation. When you catch yourself thinking about something or imagining something, maybe filled with this or that emotion or engaged in some cognitive event that's not the activity of watching your sensations, then you just redirect your attention back to sensation. Go back to your body scanning. So in this regard, Vipassana does, in fact, have a kind of focal point. It's just that it's not stationary, rather. It is sensation as it rises, rises and falls. Anyway, starting at the top of the head, you work your way slowly all the way down to the bottom of your feet, paying attention to all the sensations as they arise and fall along the way. In places where you cannot detect any sensation, what Goenka calls blind areas, you're to spend some time lingering there to develop a greater sensitivity for the nuances of what rises and falls. Conversely, when you run across a point of intense pain or gross sensation, say, a knot in a muscle or a terrible itch, take some time to dissect it. Before you, do, uh, before you do so, those sensations can feel unbearable and overwhelmingly real. But if you can just observe them, noting where the pain begins, for instance, where is its center, and then moving out from its center towards its edges, until at last where it ceases to be painful, well, you'll start to see how the black mass of that gross sensation that you experienced previously as so intensely real is not a thing at all, or at least not a constant, inherently existing thing. It moves, it pulses and fluctuates, it rises and falls, and it dissolves. You'll find a lot of things like this happening as you just pay attention to your sensations using Vipassana procedures. At all costs, just like in Samatha, one is not to move or to react to anything one observes. One simply observes. And during insight meditation, one moves on. The point, I think, is that whether one engages in Vipassana or Samatha meditation, one is learning not to identify a true, inherently existing self with any of these ego fluctuations. In all cases, one learns to leave the ego behind in order to glean a loving glimpse of the true nature of reality, contemplative insight into what is. Okay, so now you have the basics of the two standard forms of meditation that are talked about and practiced in contemplative education programs. But realize that there are many other contemplative practices besides these, ladies and gentlemen. Recall the simple experiences of love, appreciation, and wonder that we discussed earlier in the words of Josef Pieper. Next, consider other contemplative experiments like loving-kindness meditations. These are really simple and good. They don't take very long, and they simply involve you leading your students through the exercise of well-wishing towards others, of thinking and feeling love, kindness, and compassion directed towards other people. Another thing you might try is mindful walking. Some, some folks do this really, really slowly, trying to pay attention to every movement as it transpires. I prefer walking at a brisk pace myself. Essentially, Mindful walking is the same sort of thing as meditation 
you do while you're sitting down, except you're walking. Maybe follow your breath as you walk. Maybe recite your mantra as you walk. But as you walk, you're being mindful. That's to say, if you have a worry or a fear or an anger or a desire that arises while you're walking, you let it go and you focus back, back upon your walking or your breathing or your mantra. You learn, in other words, not to be swept up and carried away by all the flux of things that rise and fall as you're walking. At a local monastery in Calgary, every Wednesday evening, the nuns there uh, precede their public sitting or Chan meditation sessions with 15 minutes of walking meditation, followed immediately with a short, brisk running meditation. It's worth trying. Besides these rather explicitly meditative practices, there are other contemplative exercises you might try with students. Or if not with your students, maybe with your spouse, a friend, or one of your own children. The one I'm thinking of here, in particular, is called deep listening. Now, when we're listening as teachers in the classroom, mostly we're critical listeners, right? That is... We listen to our students in order to find out what they think, what they understand, what they do not understand. We listen critically in order to assess them so that we might offer them good formative instruction or uh, diagnose their difficulties. But we also listen like this because we're forced to by the busyness that is the life of the teacher. We have to be efficient with our ears. No time to waste, eh? Got to figure out what that kid needs, because there's a line of them, and they need our attention, every one of them. Academics and PhD professional types are really bad that way, incidentally, but for less noble reasons. That is, academics tend only to listen to each other in order to find the chinks in each other's armor, in order to detect the faulty logic or the holes in the argument that will provide us with the opportunity to tear down our opponents and to carve out a space for our own academic positions. Deep listening is like neither of these things, ladies and gentlemen. Deep listening is where you listen without judgment or critique. You don't interrupt. You don't listen in order to find a weakness or to pinpoint a problem or a misunderstanding. You don't listen in order to destroy or to develop a program of improvement for the other person. You listen, you just listen. Similar to the way that you'd watch when your little boy or your little girl says, Daddy, Daddy, look at me. Your kids don't want you to judge them as they play or to offer them advice about how to do whatever they're doing better. They only want you to see them. They're hungry for being seen by one who can recognize and affirm their existence as good. They seek the loving gaze from you. This is the nature of deep listening too, ladies and gentlemen. When we listen deeply, we're listening lovingly, acceptingly, attentively. We're paying as careful attention as we are able to the being of another. This is a different sort of thing than listening critically. Maybe you know somebody who can do this. Maybe you know somebody who, when you speak with them, you feel actually they really hear you, really know you. Mary Rose O'Reilly says that deep listening is akin to listening somebody into existence. Try it sometime. Another way, or another sort of contemplative practice that is common in contemplative education programming is known as body focusing. Whereas knowing is most often associated with the head, both the ancients and contemporary neuroscience uh, support the idea of a a body-wide mind, and that shifting awareness to the body may help to open to a state past the analytic. In particular, 
contemplative education advocates recommend uh, focusing attention on coming into awareness of one's heart beating in one's chest and combining this with a loving-kindness meditation that might then be radiated out towards others. If all these practices sound a bit too remote from actual curriculum-related activities, you might be relieved to know that some fit very well with practices you probably already do from time to time in your own classroom. Say you're an English teacher. Maybe you're acquainted with the contemplative practice of having kids use concentrated language. English teachers very often enjoin students to practice this when they ask them to write haiku poetry, which attempts to encapsulate the sacredness of an instant or of an experience of the natural world in as few syllables as possible. And then there's free writing which involves the uninterrupted flow of thoughts to paper without concern for grammar, syntax, analytic precision, and so forth. It's most akin to keeping an ordinary diary or journal writing. Contemplative teacher practitioner Richard Brady offers his own instructions to students as follows, quote, For the last two years, um, my students have done five minutes of free writing every Friday. My instructions are, Spend the next five minutes writing down whatever comes into your awareness. Do not stop writing. Should you find nothing in your mind, write, My mind is blank, over and over until something shows up. I never read this writing. It's only for the students. Many take it. Many take to it from the start. Others report being initially put off by the randomness of their minds, but over time find their thinking becoming more coherent. The exercise of writing takes on real value. On the rare occasions I forget it is writing day, the students are quick to remind me." Unquote. So there are plenty of other things you might try with your students. For instance, some teachers use a ring gong or a small uh, Japanese bell in their classrooms to begin classes to settle students and to focus attention before or after lessons. Alternatively, you might have students listen to the sound of leaves rustling in the wind through a classroom window. Or, if you're all, to get, all together outside as a focal point for meditative practices. When students become aware that their attention is strayed, ask them to notice where it has wandered and gently to come back to the sound. Another popular exercise is mindful raisin eating. Students and teachers can use this activity to cultivate attention while experiencing the slow and mindful eating of a raisin which might easily and cheaply be distributed to each student in a classroom. In Sid Brown's book, A Buddhist in the Classroom, includes a host of valuable experiments in contemplative education. One of the most interesting of these is a Walmart meditation exercise in which students enter a spiritually arid space like Walmart and transform the experience through experimentation with walking meditation. Almost any classroom activity may be transformed into a contemplative one simply by slowing the activity long enough to behold to facilitate deep attention to an intimate familiarity with the object of study. Part of structuring such a contemplative space involves creating downtime that's unstructured, uh, unplanned, and open to discovery, as well as placing fewer subjects before students and allowing them to go deeper into each one. <laughs>